Hey friends, it's Pastor Kyle from Common Grace and I want to welcome you to worship in this second week of Advent. Today we get to light two candles on our Advent wreath. We also get to celebrate communion. I would invite you to grab some bread and some juice for that later in the service. Uh, but let's begin by lighting this candle of peace. Uh, our focus is on peace this week. We remember that last week uh, we lit the candle of hope. That's how we began our journey, trusting that God meets us in the midst of this season with hope that we can be vulnerable and open because we trust that God receives us in the midst of that. And this week, we light the candle of peace in a world that seems uh, so torn apart in so many ways. What a good reminder it is that God is our Prince of Peace. In the prelude to John's gospel, he speaks about the incarnation like this. What has come into being in him was life, and this life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overtake it. In the midst of challenge and strife, concern and disappointment, we have peace. Because we know the promise is that the light has come into the world, and that the darkness cannot, shall not, will not overcome it. Would you pray with me? Lord God, teach us to walk in your path of peace. Let us know peace of Christ within ourselves and share that light with others. May we come to live in peace with you, with ourselves, and with our neighbors this day, this season, and in every season to come. All this we ask and pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue in worship together. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. December, I have a question for you. What do you get wrapped up in? Maybe it's your favorite video game and you get so wrapped up in it that when your mom calls you for dinner, your hand is cramping and well, you forgot you didn't do your homework. Or maybe it is your favorite book. You turn page after page until the end, way past lights out and well, tomorrow you're going to be tired. You can even get wrapped up 
into Christmas cookies. Oh, you can have one and another and then one more and well, you've got a tummy ache. Any good thing can go wrong when you have too much. However, there is one gift that we can never have too much of. One gift that we can open over and over. At Christmas, we realize that God's greatest gift is the birth of God's Son, Jesus. Now, since August, we have been making our way through the Bible, a collection of 66 books full of wisdom and poetry and prophecy and a big story of God's love for us. And one of the most incredible events of all time is the moment when God sent God's Son Jesus to live here on earth with us. There is nothing like it in human history. Jesus' birth is truly the heart of Christmas. As we spend the month unwrapping the story of Christmas, we're going to memorize a verse in the Bible that reminds us what it's all about. Luke wrote this in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This Christmas, when you remember that you have doubts, you can trust that God keeps God's promises. If you feel like you're up against impossible odds, remember you have a relationship with a God who can do the impossible. And when you feel alone, remember that God sent Jesus to earth to teach us about God's never ending love and that God will always be with us. That's why this season you can find joy, you can have hope, and you can discover peace because of God's love for everyone. Christmas is about God's greatest gift to everyone all across time. I can't wait to unwrap the story with you this month and to see how we celebrate. Mary stares into her baby's peaceful sleeping eyes. Gently rocking, softly, sweetly, singing a lullaby. As she kisses her baby boy Her face lights up with unbounded joy And she adores him She adores him She adores him Jesus Christ our Lord Shepherds tending on a hillside hear the angels sing. Make their way to Bethlehem to see the newborn king. They stand around the manger in awe, knowing that they're looking at the face of God. Wise men guided by their faith travel toward a star Until they find the King of Kings sleeping in a barn They bow down their heads and pray When they see the Savior laying in the hay
It feels odd on this day perhaps to, to pray for peace uh, because we know so little of it in the world. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen violence against the LGBTQ community. For the last many months, we've seen violence raging in Ukraine. Uh, we experienced violence in our own city, and we know the distress and disease and dispeace that exists within ourselves, within our homes, within our communities and our workplaces. It feels odd to pray for peace because we know so little of it, and yet we pray anyway. And not only do we pray, but we expect, we hope, and we work led by God and led by grace to bring about the vision of a peaceable kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So I would invite you to join me in prayer as we go to God together. God of light and love, in this season we come to you in prayer even as we recognize that you are the one who comes to us. You come to us in the gift of a vulnerable child born in an out of the way place. You came to us offering gifts of life and freedom and hope and peace. We are a people who know what it is to long for peace, but we aren't practiced in the art of it. In this time that we share together, may we grow in our understanding of what it means uh, for you, our God, our Savior and Sustainer, to be our perfect peace. May we have the audacity to work for peace in our day. When the troubles of the world seem to outmatch our capacity, may we be reminded that we work not alone. When wars and rumors of wars seem to flood the airways, may we look to you and be prepared to receive our redemption. When the need and the hurt and the pain of the world seems to be too much, may we discover that our direction and our strength and our guidance and our path will ever be led by you. Give us courage and wisdom then to be peacemakers and help us to find the blessing that you have promised in this sacred and challenging work. And God, forgive us for the times and the places that we've fallen short of this vision that you have for our lives. Help us to put the needs of our neighbors ahead of ourselves. In this season, move us to true generosity as a response of gratitude for your ongoing presence with us. Move us to true compassion as a response of thankfulness for your great mercy towards us. Move us towards true goodwill as a response of appreciation for all that you've done in our lives. Help us make room for you in our hearts, in our lives, and in the world this year. Give us a sense of hope and wonder that we might learn and experience the path of peace in the coming days and years. Amen. Friends, where you are, I would invite you to grab your bread and your juice that you may partake in this communion meal as we continue in that spirit of prayer to bless these gifts and to prepare ourselves to be transformed by the gift of God's presence among us. Would you pray with me? God, we know it's a good and a right and a joyful thing for us always and everywhere to give our thanks and praise to you for you created us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love has failed and we've turned away, your love has always remained steadfast. You spoke to us through the prophets, called us out of captivity and made covenant to be your, our God. And so with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn this day. Holy are you, Lord God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, you anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. It was by the baptism of his living, dying resurrection that you gave birth to your church, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit, and promised to be with us always by the power of your Holy Spirit. Remember on that night that Jesus would be betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room, he took a loaf of bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took a cup, he gave thanks to you, Lord God, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. So, Lord God, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice and on each one of us gathered in all of our places. Make these gifts be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. It is through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, that we pray all honor and glory be yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. And we ask that you would hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, where you are, I would invite you to take whatever bread or food it is that you're sharing, to tear it. If you're gathered with somebody else, I would invite you to take a piece and to 
uh, serve one another or if you're gathered by yourself to take a piece and hold it and to remember that we who are many are made one because we all share in the same body the same life of Christ. This cup over which we give thanks, it's a sharing in the salvation offered through him. Would you take your juice, would you take your bread, would you receive it and be reminded of God's presence as we sing together with one another and celebrate the gift of love come down to dwell with us, of God coming to be among us, that we set our, our hearts and our sights on in the midst of this holiday season. Follow the star to a place unexpected Would you believe after all we've projected A child in a manger Lowly and small, the weakest of all Unlikeliest hero wrapped in his mother's shawl Just a child, is this who we've waited for? in their homes how many grades have become the least for me and how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart how many fathers give up their sons for me bringing out gifts for the new Born Savior, all that we have, whether costly or meek, because we believe. Gold for his honor and frankincense for his pleasure and myrrh for the cross he'll suffer. Do you believe? Is this who we've waited for? down from their thrones how many lords have abandoned their homes how many greats have become the least and how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart how many fathers give up their sons for me only one did that join me in prayer. Good and holy God, we give you thanks for this eternal mystery, this bread and this juice by which you make yourself known to us. We give you thanks for the eternal mystery of the incarnation of God come to dwell among us and how that continues to have an impact on us this day as we continue in this Advent journey to be open and vulnerable, to be waiting on how it is that you might move in our lives. Make us aware of how this meal might strengthen us for that work, for the sharing of love and grace and for the waiting and anticipating of the good news that is to come. Be with us now, be with us in the week to come. May all that we do bring glory and honor to you. Amen. As we continue in worship, I would invite you to uh, consider giving of your gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can see on the screen ways to do that. Uh, what you can know is that as we're in the midst of this season, as we have celebrated our living nativity, uh, what your gifts do is they help us tell this story to the world. They help us invite others into this experience, into this grace, into this love that we find in God. So it goes to a great cause. I would invite you to give as an act of generosity in response to all that God has given to us and to trust that those are a blessing for us and for those beyond our community.
Hi friends and welcome to week two of this Honest Advent journey. Last week we read from the opening of Matthew's Gospel, the genealogy of Jesus. This week we get to read from the prelude of John's Gospel that begins uh, right at the beginning of the Gospel, verse 1-1. We're going to begin there. We're going to read a few verses and jump down. Uh, these words are very likely familiar to you, but I would invite you to try to hear them anew. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. He was in the world, this is now verse 10, but the world, and the world came to being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his people and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, The one who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So way back uh, at the beginning of Common Grace, before we even officially launched, uh, there is one of my very favorite memories, um, really uh, of Common Grace, but of, but of anything uh, that's happened. So we were um, just a few weeks from getting ready to launch. We were a, a church community that wasn't worshiping on Sunday morning. Uh, we were a community though. We were gathering, we were praying, we were excited. We had this vision for what God was doing with us. I was connecting with business leaders in the area around uh, where we would meet at the Ball Conference Center. We had uh, built relationships. We had invited people to come and be a part of this. And then just a few weeks before we were ready to launch, before we even had a worship leader, it was a, a very tense time, we hosted a community event called a Fall Festival. It was our very first one. It was an absolute blast and it was an opportunity to invite business leaders and folks from the community to come and to celebrate the season, to hear a little bit more about this church, this community that was coming that would be called Common Grace, invite them to come and be a part of it. And so children came in Halloween costumes. We we had uh, snacks and all kinds of activities. It was such a good day. In the midst of all of that, there was one little boy who was dressed head to toe in his Spider-Man outfit. I mean, he had the whole getup. Uh, his, his legs and feet were covered. He had the, the muscles um, and he had the mask over top of his head. Uh, it was clearly Spider-Man. And so he seemed to be having a good time doing the trunk or treating. And at one point, I think he walked up to, to my wife or, or they, they sort of interacted with one another. And she said, look, it's Spider-Man. And the boy tensed up and he pulled off his mask and he began to wail and cry as he said, I'm Harry Potter. It was one of the funniest things that I have ever seen. Uh, I still can't hardly tell it without laughing. There was no costume underneath the costume. It wasn't as if he was Superman who had actually been Clark Kent. No, he just pulled off his mask and said that he was Harry Potter and he was so distraught that she had not recognized that. Friends, I think in our own ways, many of us do this in our own lives. It may not be uh, quite that comical, it may not be quite that clear, uh, but we put on certain masks, we project certain sort of images, uh, we want to believe certain things about our own identity, so much so that we'll get distraught, we'll get upset, we'll get defensive if other people see through it or don't see things the same way. We invest a lot of energy in projecting a certain kind of image. We put masks on in order to protect ourselves. Uh, we we do all of this all of the time and, and sort of pretend to be something that we are not. It's a defense mechanism. And in the midst of this Advent, part of what we're asking, part of what I'm inviting you to, part of what Scott Erickson is inviting you to do is to let down some of our guard. This week, we're going to talk about that specifically around identity. We do this. We put on these masks and these projections in one way or another in all sorts of ways. We hide our true selves, our true identity, the, the still small part of our own being, our souls. Parker Palmer is one of my favorite authors, and, and he says the soul is like a wild animal. It's tough, resilient, savvy, and self-sufficient, and yet exceedingly shy. 
Sometimes I think about our innermost being, our, our, our truest identity as a wounded animal. Each of us carries uh, wounds in our lives, and sometimes we are more tenacious, more aggressive with others, uh, the deeper or the fresher uh, the, the injuries that we experience are. You know, we, we are people who have injuries. We're, we're people who are worn down and tired. We're people who have been hurt and betrayed. We're people who carry our questions and our doubts. Now, that's not the sum total of who we are. I don't mean to say that. We, we certainly have strength and power as well. Uh, we, we have um, a lot of capacity. Uh, we we are, are capable. We uh, are creative and loving. We build things. We, we build relationships. We, we make our way through healing. Uh, we, we are a, a sum of all of that, of the good and the bad, of the beautiful and the ugly, uh, of the clear and the murky. All of that is a part of our identity. And sometimes we are honest about that. We put that out to the world. Sometimes we're vulnerable. Other times we put on those masks. We try to hide all of that. Somehow, it seems to me, in the midst of the holiday season, all of that gets magnified. We're tired and worn down, and that can happen especially in the holiday season as we've got the hustle and bustle. We have questions and doubts, and, and maybe this whole idea of, a, of an incarnation of God come to dwell among us, uh, this whole notion uh, of immaculate conception of this baby being born 2,000 years ago, having any impact on the way you and I live today, maybe all of that feels a little bit uncertain. We, we have our doubts and our questions in this season. Is there indeed goodwill for all? Is reconciliation always possible? I believe this season can also magnify and, and, and draw attention to the strengths. We get the invitation uh, for creativity. We get the opportunity to express love in different sorts of ways. We're encouraged in all of the, the, the scripture readings and the religious readings and in the society at large to think about what reconciliation and peace and goodwill and restoration uh, looks like. We're invited to name some of our power as we move into a new year. All of this seems to get magnified in the midst of the holidays. In the midst of this holiday this year, together we're on a journey called Honest Advent that's inviting us to be a little bit more real, a little bit more, more vulnerable, and a little bit more open as we do these four weeks leading up to Christmas. Uh, we remember that, that last week we said that a part of the invitation of Advent is to let go of our certainty and enter into a time of waiting, of anticipating, and of wondering, and to allow ourselves to be in that place. We, we said that vulnerability isn't our strong suit. It's not what we, we like to do. It's not very natural for us, and yet we know that in the midst of vulnerability, there is the possibility for creativity and restoration and healing and relationship, that there is a lot of good and beautiful things that can only come with true, authentic uh, vulnerability. Ability. And yet even that healing, even that possibility, even that potential uh, sometimes feels scary to us. We know that if we're open and we let our guard down, uh, we might find in the midst of the season that God meets us in some sort of unexpected way uh, this Christmas, that, that God might be born anew in us in ways that we didn't anticipate. And we know that Jesus takes on all the vulnerability of what it means to be human in order to build relationship with us. The challenge was whether we'd embrace that vulnerability in order that our relationship with him might grow. In two separate chapters of his book, Scott Erickson speaks about the passage that we opened with, our message with, from John's Gospel, from the prelude, the beginning. Speaking about the first section, Erickson zooms into this. He says, What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. We often talk about Jesus as the light of the world, and we often talk about Christmas as, as a light shining in the darkness. Erickson says that the Word, or the Christ, or Jesus, gave life to everything and every Everyone, and that word's life brought light to everyone. Or the giver of life joins that life and brings all light to all life. It's all confusing, but, but don't get lost in the metaphor. Here's the point of all of that. He says, put simply, the function of light is to help us see more clearly. Jesus' Jesus's life helps us see our own lives with more clarity. D do you get that? Jesus is the light because he comes into the world and in him, in his message, in his living, in the inauguration of a new kingdom, his life allows us to see our life more clearly. That's what light does. And this is something that I can latch on to. I don't know about for you, but for me, in the midst of this particular holiday season, I could use some clarity. 
I, I could use some clarity uh, about what's going on in the world and about the future. I could use some clarity about decisions and, and the direction that things are going. I could use some clarity uh, about relationships and next steps that I, sh I could take. I could also use some clarity, if I'm being quite honest, about myself, about who I am, about the places in my life where I am strong and, and capable and the places where I feel uncertain. I could use some clarity in my own identity because there is a lot of internal work that I need to do. I don't know about you, but I know I could use some clarity, some light to see things for how they are. Jesus comes that we may see reality, that we may see ourselves more clearly. Then in the latter part of John's prologue that we read earlier, uh, we read again that the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. I, I love that. I just want us to pause for a minute to, to imagine that baby, that child, that infant as one who is full of grace and truth. Erickson defines truth as the actual state of the matter, seeing things as they are. He goes on to say that the truth is the end of the journey towards having a clear perspective. Truth is found when we can lay aside our own preferences and advantages and see everything the way it is. It's interesting, Erickson says, that people who spent time with Jesus consistently described him as being full of truth, having clear perspective, seeing the real. Now there's a, a connection between this clear, the clarity uh, this truth and the idea of light uh, that, that Jesus brings into the world, his raw assessment of reality. Uh, throughout his life, Jesus would uncover hidden motives, uh, deep divisions, wounds uh, inside of people and, and issues that divided people uh, and communities and relationships. He would uncover uh, much that was under the surface. He would see things as they were and he would look at people and he would see their heart. Not the way that we often see people, but, but see what was underneath and within, within our lives and within ourselves. I, I believe that Jesus invites us to look in a mirror and to see ourselves in the, in the reflection of his life and to find the truth of the matter about who we are to pause our pretensions and projections and to, to, to view, uh, uh, instead of in our entrenched corners, to, to view ourselves as he sees us, to view ourselves with a higher degree of truth as we see reality for what it really is. You know, as I was preparing this message and, and writing this, it was actually about this point that I began to get uncomfortable. You see, because when we talk about Jesus as a light, I'm, I'm good with that. Jesus comes uh, to provide light so that we can see things for what they really are to see the world. And I'm good with that. I think we need that. I need that clarity. But then when we see truth, then all of a sudden it's less about seeing what's out there and it's more about seeing what's in here. The, the truth of who I am, the truth of my identity. That's the focus for this week is identity. And all of a sudden I begin to say, I'm not really sure that I want to see that. I'm not sure that I want Jesus to see that. I'm not sure that I want Jesus to see all that's broken and, and the less flattering parts of me. I don't know that I want to confront those. We spend a lot of time putting on those masks, Harry Potter, uh, Spider-Man, putting on those masks, projecting these images because we don't want to deal with those things. And all of a sudden this very comforting thing about light. And then this bit about truth, when I combine those together, it began to make me feel a little bit uneasy. Now we're talking about venturing into true vulnerability. Now I'm feeling a little bit exposed. But there's one other piece that the prologue of John calls our attention to that I want to focus on. There's not only light that's illuminating all that is, and Jesus is not only full of truth, laying bare the actual way things are. Jesus is also full of grace. And grace is the antidote to the anxiety that I just mentioned. Grace is the unmerited and free gift of divine love given to you and I. So all of who I am, all of who I have been, and all of who I will be that I do not yet know, all of that is known by God. And all of it is wrapped in grace. We're drowning in an ocean of grace. 
There's nothing we can do about it. It's offered uh, to me without cost. Not even when I've confessed all that's wrong with me, not only uh, when I've, I've reckoned with all of it, but even before I know how to ask, before we could do any different, God comes and meets us full of truth and also grace. One more time from Erickson, to see Jesus as full of grace means there wasn't any perfection checklist that we had to, to, to meet in order to receive his presence. His arrival stands against the idea that if you do right, you get access to his presence. Instead, Jesus's presence is freely given. He never withheld it. Grace is presence not withheld. I love that. Grace is presence not withheld. Grace is God's presence not withheld. This one who was full of grace has come to dwell among us, not withholding, but being present and vulnerable and with us. Remember later in John's gospel, the second part of, of perhaps that most famous verse in the scriptures, for God so loved the world. Do you remember how it ends? It speaks about the purpose. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through the Son. In a vulnerable child, helpless as he is, we find light and an endless supply of grace. When we wrestle with our identity, when we're vulnerable, when we're open, what we find is that God meets us in the midst of that, that God takes on that same vulnerability and God wraps all of that in the free, unmerited gift of grace. All of that in endless supply sent for the purpose of healing and salvation. That's what it was uh, in, in, in John 3.16, right? Uh, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. All of this for the purpose of healing. The question in this season for us then is in the incarnation, in the inbreaking of Christ, will we allow that to illuminate our world, our inner self, our inner being, we allow it, to see, allow it to help us see things for the way they really are, to see the truth. Do we trust the grace enough to go into that work, that internal work, so that we might be transformed? Will we be still enough to receive it? I mentioned earlier Parker Palmer, and he said uh, that the soul is like a wild animal. And he continues that quote by saying this, if you want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is go crashing through the woods, shouting for the creature to come out. But if we're willing to walk quietly into the woods and sit silently for an hour or two at the base of a tree, the creature we're waiting for may well emerge. And out of the corner of our eye, we might catch a glimpse of the precious wilderness we seek. That could be uh, an explanation of what Advent is about. As we seek to lay bare a bit of our own soul and trust that the one who is full of truth and grace will meet us, we're invited to sit out in the cold and the silence and wait and to see if the truth might emerge for us. On the second weekend of Advent, as we talk about identity and we've lit the peace candle, I wonder uh, what parts of yourself have you seen for what they truly are and made peace with? Maybe that's something that's happened recently in your life. Maybe it's something that happened a long time ago. Maybe you had to do a reckoning of some sort. Where is it that, that you did the work of seeing who you truly were to make peace with who you were? You know the second question, what parts do you still need to reckon with? What parts might God be inviting you to bring into the light, to see with truth, trusting that all of it will be bathed in grace? What parts of your world, of your life, of your identity need the presence of the saving one to find healing and wholeness and peace? It is in the vulnerability and openness, in an honest assessment of our identity, that we find the possibility for transformation and wholeness that we seek. And that is a part of the invitation we have this Advent. Uh, when I think about the Christmas story, I think about a succinct example of what this process could look like. I think about Mary. Here in this woman, really this girl, uh, she, she receives this information, this, this news from a messenger of God that her entire world is about to be turned upside down. 
He tells her not to be afraid and that there is good news, but when she hears it, she fears and she wonders if this is truly good news. I think she also has to wonder if this angel has come to the right address. She wonders if he realizes who it is that he's talking to. She says, how can this be? And she wonders that because she knows herself, not only her circumstances and her actions, but she knows who she is. She knows her past and her present. She knows her strengths and her weaknesses. She knows her intellect and her folly. Like you, she knows what it is to be tired and worn down, to have questions and doubts. She also knows her own capacity and her power, her love and creativity. She knows all of it. She knows all of who she is. And so this news, this divine proclamation, this announcement from the angel, because she knows herself and her identity, it all seems a little bit perplexing. But alas, the divine has not made a mistake. The angel did not show up to the wrong address, has not spoken to the wrong person, has not intended this message for someone else and not for her has not intended this message for someone else and not for you. The light of the world, full of grace and truth, has come. And Mary, in her wisdom, demonstrates for us what it might look like to receive that. Let it be for me, as you have said. Friends, when the light comes to you, I hope that you will say the same. Let it be for me as you have said. I want to read this bit from uh, Scott Erickson's book, Honest Advent. And I would invite you to hear this perhaps as an invitation. So it is with you as well that the divine proclamation will come through very unexpected ways. It very well may be through uh, the ignored and marginalized aspects of your life, the embarrassing, unsuccessful parts, that if you take the time to listen, You'll begin to hear the angelic proclamation, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will be cause for great joy. This year, where in your life does that need to happen? Where is it that you need to hear that there is good news, even in the unexpected places, even in the messier parts? What areas in your internal self, in your reality, do you need to wrestle with? Where are you seeking peace? However, and wherever, and about whatever it is that the divine proclamation shows up, may you say, as Mary did, let it be for me as you have said. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to wrap up this time of worship, my hope and my prayer for you is that you will be vulnerable and open in this season, that you will wrestle with the parts of, the ide of your identity uh, that this season invites for you, and that you'll trust that all of that is surrounded by grace, that God meets us right in the midst of the messiness and the uncertainty, and there will be healing for you. Go out into the world to reflect the light of promise, to see things as they are, to share truth in love, and to experience and invite others into God's grace. Go in peace, friends. Amen. Amen.